You're listening to the Salty Sex Cast with Mariah and friends. Minimize the fear. Expand your awareness. We are back for another episode. It is Mariah here. And if you're just tuning in, I want to reintroduce myself. I am a board certified health and wellness coach and a certified health education specialist that has had a passion on going on a journey, finding information and knowledge about sex and sexuality. Um, Growing up in a strict religious home, that was a door that was always closed to me and told like no touch. (laughs) And so as an adult, I'm going to discover uh, that right now with all of you. And I have a wonderful guest. I have Rachel Overvol with me, who is also happens to be coach, but she is centered a little bit differently than I am, where I am more of that health and wellness um, guided uh, coach. She is this beautiful somatic um, sex and intimacy coach. So I really want you to unpack what that means, Rachel, for all of us. But first, say hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, so I also grew up in fundamentalist, I call it high control religion. I think that's mm-hmm. the best Or high demand, yeah. High demand. Yeah, because it kind of just is a blanket for all of them. <laughs> yeah, so I also grew up that way as well and left in my early 20s about 10 years ago. And so grew up not having any connection to my body, grew up having no sex education or any availability to even understand sex or pleasure started my healing journey, going to therapy, going um, to all of these different practices and trying to come back into my body in my early 20s. And then it wasn't really until my mid 20s where I started to actually realize that my sexuality was a big part that I needed to start healing. And I found that it was really difficult to find therapists who had sex education, first of all, Mm -hmm. or had any relationship education. (laughs) And so I found somatics, which is body-based therapy. And that is really what changed my life is learning how to be in community with my body instead of being at war with my body. So I went back to school to become certified in somatics and then also went back to become um, certified in sex education because I wanted to make sure that as I'm working with clients, I have holistic care opportunity. And as sex comes up, because it will, I actually have the credentials and the availability to talk about it really freely and openly. And so that's what I do. I really work with women to come into attunement with their own bodies and live pleasure filled lives. I love that. And I'm so glad you took, you know, maybe what could have been, um, a really bad experience and let that fuel the reason in your journey and your passion right now. Um, I think so many of us, when we are just coming to realization, either the things that are lacking in our lives or that we've been, um, without, you know, that it is this, woe is me. Oh no, I'm missing out on all of these things. I have to learn to live my life in a totally different way. Or, you know, it's just this shock sometimes. Um, but to be able to use that as a momentum, um, for steps forward and K okay, I've been missing this, but maybe this other person doesn't have to be missing this and can connect with it and heal from it the same way. Um, so break down, uh, somatic a little bit more for those who maybe have never heard of it. Um, and maybe even in some examples, like for beginners, you know, how do you even know, what are you talking about? We all have bodies, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there's some folks out there that have just no clue and no experience with, um, sitting with their, their shell, their person. Yeah. And so much of our intuition comes from being in our bodies. And so much of high demand religion is about taking us out of our bodies. Our body is the pathway to hell. Right. And so learning and teaching people how to be in their bodies is key for people with religious trauma and also just people walking through this world because even in a capitalistic system we are also demanded to be outside of our bodies Mm -hmm. and 
one of the biggest things that somatic teaches us is that our bodies are like wholly worthy. There's nothing we have to do to earn worthiness. We are just worthy. And once we can believe that it really changes the way we start operating in the world. So I do this through a lot of different mediums and some people might already do, but they're just like, not maybe have the name for it, that it's a somatic exercise, but dance and journaling and meditation and breath work and touching the body and talking to the body, noticing the body. It's all really simple things, but it comes, it becomes really powerful when you make it intentional and make it a part of your practice. So learning like okay, before I get on this podcast, my chest is feeling really tight. I know that that means that I'm a little anxious, but I also know my body really well that when my chest is tight with this anxiety, it's like an excited anxious. So I don't need to be nervous so I can calm myself down. Right. Mm. And so really also understanding that when our body is giving us these signals, it's talking to us and they're talking to us so that we can listen and respond. And it's not a war. We don't have to shut it down when we learn how to be in community with the body it's such a beautiful relationship that offers such depth of healing that we can't get in traditional like CBT therapy. Mm -hmm. That's really um, powerful to be able to listen and then know what it, you know, it's just first awareness. That's the biggest step is just being aware of what all these different things are and then what it means. Um, You know, a huge part of coaching and health and wellness from my own background is a lot of mindfulness, being fully aware, a lot of breath work, a lot of breathing, um, you know, meditation type activities, but more of mindfulness. It's not as, um, just being fully present. So you can listen, shutting out those distractions, um, and how much I was not understand or not noticing how tense I was in almost every situation in my life. Um, even my jaw so much will be, you know, like there's some days I'm like, Oh, this is really sore. Why was that? Like, I wasn't even paying attention. I was clenching. Um, but you know, that stress or whatever was happening and just not being aware of it. And now that I'm aware and, or at least trying to continue to be more aware, (laughs) I am not perfect at this at all. Um, it really helps me, you know, put in interventions. I now have choice on, okay, if I am clenching my jaw, that means that something is maybe giving me anxiety or I'm worried about something. So then what it is, I need to be aware and then pick something that's going to support and help me with that because clenching my jaw isn't getting rid of the stress. It's just the, the, you know, blinking warning light that something's up. Right. And so it's something that has been really easy for me to pick up, but I know can feel really far-fetched for others who have again, been, you know, conditioned their entire life to remove from their body, to not listen, to shut those things down. You're supposed to listen and watch for outward signs or, um, listen to other people, um, whether that be, you know, in religion or anything else, but typically you'll hear those in those types of, um, scenarios. So for your own journey, um, what were maybe some of the very first things you noticed in your body as you were just kind of becoming aware? Mm, well, leaving religion made me realize that I had like an anxiety disorder, something that wasn't allowed to be discussed in religion, because if you have anxiety, you're just not trusting God enough. Right. Yes. And so going to my first therapist after leaving religion and he was like, has anyone ever talked to you about anxiety? And I was like, no. And he was like, okay, well, you definitely have an anxiety disorder. And I was like, I don't know. I don't. And he was like, let me talk to you about, do you have racing thoughts? Do you feel like your mind is a hamster wheel? Do you like anxiously touch things? Do you feel like you can't, like you pace a lot and you can't calm down? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, that's all signs of anxiety disorder. Mm. And I remember like some of the first signs when I started going to somatic because I couldn't work through my anxiety disorder in traditional therapy. And I finally got to work through a lot of it and make a piece with it through somatics. And so some of the first things I noticed, and one of the things my somatic practitioner taught me is 
let's reframe anxiety as your body giving you signals. It's not bad. It's just your body telling you something. So if we learn how to pay attention to it, we can learn how to calm the body down. So if I know that I'm going to bed and I'm stressed out because I don't sleep well and my tongue is at the roof of my mouth and my shoulders are up to the top of my ears, let's calm, let's bring the shoulders down. Let's feel the tongue off the roof of the mouth, right? Exactly like what you were talking about, clenching the jaw. It's like, if we know that these things are like signs that we're going into a panic attack or we're going into high anxiety, we can start moving the body into more neutral, right? And more in that neutral nervous system. And so I think the biggest thing similarly to you was that I was really tense. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I didn't know what it felt like to just be chill. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, so what are some things that you work with, um, with that somatic, um, with your clients? Um, obviously the awareness is the biggest piece, <laughs> but what do you do once you you're aware? Yeah. Once you're aware, it's really learning how to regulate the nervous system then. And the biggest thing I do with nervous system regulation is focusing on pleasure. And that's where the sex aspect comes in is really having my clients hone in on what does it feel like to feel pleasure in your body, both sexually and non and start to notice that. Cause when we're experiencing pleasure, our nervous system will be regulated because mm-hmm. pleasure is presence. So how do we experience pleasure, right? Is it a walk where There's no destination in mind. You're just like noticing the sun on your skin and the wind in your hair and how good that feels on your body. That's pleasure. Dancing can be pleasure. Masturbation can also be pleasure. But that's like one of the key things that I focus with clients is like, let's learn how to experience pleasure in the body now. Let's Mm -hmm. learn how to experience peace and presence. Because once we start experiencing continual moments of pleasure, we start to inherently understand that we are worthy of experiencing pleasure. Mm, how powerful. Um, so for, for some of your clients that are coming to you, um, what are some typical, I don't want to say ailments, let's just say reasons. <laughs> what are some, you know, things that signs that they saw and they were like, yep, I need help. Um, yeah. Do you have a typical client or is it just all over? I think, so I have a memoir called Finding Feminism, and that is my story of growing up in religion and leaving. And so I have a lot of people that find me through that, that also have religious trauma experiences. But then I also have a lot of people that just don't have healthy relationships with sex that want to work with me Mm -hmm. and don't know, like, I think the most common thing is I work with women and people who identify as female. And the most common thing I work with is a lot of women that come to me and be like, I've never had an orgasm or I don't really experience pleasure in sex. I feel super disassociated. I can't even be in my body during sex. So those are kind of like the two camps I would say that I work within. Mm -hmm. And the sexuality is so huge because it goes back to that peace and presence. Like we have to learn how to be in the body. They go hand in hand in those moments. It really is such a hard thing to unlearn when you have been conditioned for so long, your body is an evil thing. Um, these feelings aren't okay. Uh, you shouldn't be having these thoughts. You're meant to only procreate or with a, a committed partner. And that's maybe some of those high demand religions believe that. So to then become just aware and allowing that to happen and not have all that shame and fear and anxiety around pleasure. It's like, Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm feeling pleasure. I need to shut it off. That is so such a hard switch to flip or you may overswing that pendulum and then be like everything, everyone, everywhere. (laughs) Um, and and not enjoy it. Like you're just after the next like pleasure fix, I should say, and not taking it as just a moment for yourself. Um, so it's just, it's a very interesting journey that I have been on my, for myself as well. And, um, for you, um, so you have the finding feminism, your book, and in that, how do you portray like where you went with some of this realization? 
Um, that's a great question. So it's really deals mostly with uh, sexual repression. The book talks mostly about that and purity culture, what that was growing up and leaving. And the realizations kind of come towards the end of the book when I'm getting into my early 20s and mid 20s. And then um, it ends because the book was published three years ago and I wrote it four or five years ago. So it was published a while ago. It'd be really fun to go back and do like an addendum to the end of like, here's where I'm at now. Because it was really the book that got me into this work. I had been going to somatic therapy, but I had not thought about becoming a practitioner and by any means. I was in technology sales. I sold technology to school districts. <laughs> and, and I used to go to Utah all the time for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then when the book came out, I had tons of women reaching out to me. And they're like, do you coach? Do you work with women? And I was like, if I have this many people reaching out, this has to be a higher calling that and not in a religious way, but in like a soul purpose way. Mm-hmm. And so I followed that and I went back and started on this new journey of leaving corporate America and working with women full time. That's so cool. Um, what are some of the services you do offer? What do they look like? Yeah. So I do, I lead women's circles once a month. I have that. And those are virtual. I typically do some, I'm in Denver. I'll do some live workshops at least once a month at different places around here. And then I work one-on-one with women. And that's probably my favorite way because I really love getting to know people personally. I, I'm a cancer. I love relationships. I love being (laughs) relational with people. (laughs) So I love, love, love working one-on-one and especially like, because you brought this up shame, like how do we, you know, move the shame out of our bodies. And so many women I work with, whether they grew up in religion or not, just like being socialized female in this world, there's immense shame. Mm-hmm. And so watching women step into my office and going from small, un- unauthentic versions of themselves to like shame-free, vivacious people is such a beautiful gift that I get to see. And that's like my favorite thing to do. And my favorite thing about this work. That's so, so cool. So when you're, do you coach just in person or virtual as well? I do mostly virtual. Um, Mm -hmm. It just depends on the season. And if I have people in Denver, if I have people virtually or what's going on, thank God um, in this way for the pandemic, because it made all of these like coaching practices so much more accessible. I think Mm -hmm. before it, a lot of people were like, I only want to go in person. And now people are so used to zoom that it's really nice. It is so nice being a coach myself, being able to do that. And I'm not having to factor in travel time. Um, if I'm going somewhere, if someone's coming here, um, yes, it's so much easier (laughs) for for being virtual and, um, you know, it does have its hangups a little bit. I feel that, um, as a coach, you pick up on a lot of the nonverbal cues and other things. And I'm sure even as you're looking at a lot of the body movements too, or lack of, you know, the tenseness, um, like that, that could pose some challenges, right. You know, it has a trade-off, but just being very fully aware in that practice, um, for yourself, I'm sure is a big help. So Yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's a really, it's really fun when I get to be in person with people, but also like the virtual is a great way to make this accessible and make me able to work with people around the world, which has been really cool as well. So it's this like blessing as well. (laughs) That's wonderful. So mainly work with women and usually those who are looking for you know, connecting with their sexual selves, maybe healing from shame or anything else like that. Um, what has been maybe some surprising things in your own practice for yourself that you've been able to discover? Um, I think that's just the best thing about being a coach is you're always just super, I don't know if like hyper aware is the best thing to say, but I'm like, I just made a connection for myself, like in the middle of a coaching session with somebody else. Um, yeah. yeah. Anything like that. Yeah. It's so true. You like make your own connections as you're working with people and you're like, ah, oh, that was an aha moment for me too. <laughs> and I think one of the biggest things is like this repeating question that I get maybe not asked 
this explicitly, but almost always implicitly of like, am I normal? Mm. You talk about sex. And so that is like a really interesting question that I didn't necessarily expect because going on my own journey and getting here, I was like, yeah, like there's nothing normal. Right. And also being in situations or like school with lots of people who are like sex educated and sex positive, and then starting to work with women again and having this question come up all the time and realizing like how deep this oppression is, even mm-hmm. in non religious communities. And so answering that question over and over again in different ways for different situations and explaining, like, hey, there is no normal, that's probably the biggest aha moment that I repeatedly have with women is this like, yeah, there's no such thing as normal. That's like, and here, let me explain it to you in this way. And let me give you these examples. And let me tell you like why this thing that you're interested in or why this like fetish or kink or thing you want to try is totally okay. And there's no shame in it. Like you are allowed to explore. Like, and Emily Nagowski says this, and she's a researcher and the author of Come As You Are, but Mm -hmm. her, uh, quote is, um, there's nothing bad in sex besides non-consent and unwanted pain. And when I tell clients that it's always like this aha moment of like, oh, I can do things as long as there's consenting parties and I'm not causing unwanted pain. That like opens the door to freedom when they understand that. Uh, freedom to explore, be themselves, um, not worry the whole time. Am I normal? Am I okay? is this my part, you know, is my partner okay with this, you know, whatever. It's just like that, those thoughts circulating all the time. I think all of my early sexual encounters were all filled with that. Like it rarely could I just relax and be present. Um, it was so worried about, did I shave good enough? Oh my gosh. Are they going to notice that one boob is bigger than the other. Like all of these things that took away that robbed me from Mm -hmm. that passion and excitement of being in there in that moment. And, um, I hate that that was, that took over so many of my thoughts, but I also give myself permission to that's totally okay. Because looking from my history and just what the world tells women in general, I mean, a lot of them, it sounds like they're looking for just permission. And that's what we've been told forever is we have to wait for permission. We can't just go and blaze our own path. Um, Like who does that? And so it's really, I love seeing like this just new generation of, of women who are very empowered, who are very just willing to fumble around and make mistakes and not wait for somebody to tell them um, it's okay. And you have permission, right? It's just like, you know what, let's do that. But there's many of us that still need just some validation. And there's something very, very powerful from like female to female validation as well. Right. So I love that you work with women on that. Um, you know, thinking of some of my past clients being able to connect with that as well. They were just looking for a lot of that. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like most of what we do as coaches is hold safe spaces for people to be authentically themselves, like, and for them mm-hmm. to tell us things and for our face not to change and for us not to judge them. And it just be like, okay, yeah, that's a part of who you are. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. write your, and like what I'll do with clients too, I'm like, write your own permission slip, like go home, get a piece of paper and literally write your own permission slip. Like you are allowed to experience life. You are allowed to be in your body. You are allowed to experience pleasure. You're allowed to have really great sex. Like you're allowed to do these things. Mm. I think we found the title of our episode. Women, you are allowed. <laughs> you are allowed. I love it. <laughs> it's the title of your next book. Okay, Rachel. Yes. I'm, I should start working on that one soon. <laughs> I'll co-author just a name only. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, that's so great. Um, it really is the truth though. So many people are out there looking for validation, very worried because they haven't had that in so long and so, or, or it at all. And to self validate is such a foreign concept as well. Um, so I know you have a, a, a pretty awesome online presence with your TikToks and reels and all of that. Um, and I'm pretty popular, like folks are tuning in. It's, um, it's a great way to get that 
education and permission as well. We've been watching them. So they're great. But what are some of your favorite pieces of just having that online presence for others? Mm, I think that the favorite piece is the connection. It's just really nice to be able to connect with people and like make social media friends, I guess. And also like peers and colleagues too. people like um, Dr. Kate Bellistry is like an uh, incredible sex therapist who I met through Instagram and we've become very good friends. And that's like a really great beautiful piece of social media is that there can be friendships that develop from this getting to meet most of my clients through that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been amazing. It's been hard though in the last year, um, because of all the, I'm sure you've had it too, all of the like bands around saying sex and pleasure and everything. So my account's been shut down like three or four times and yeah. So the last year has been like, how do I figure out how to get this message across? It is very important. Mm -hmm about like sex positivity and pleasure and experiencing in your bodies without getting my account shut down, which is, I'm sure you, do you deal with that too? All the time, all the time. I've had the, the whole slap on the hand and more shadow band, which Instagram claims they do not do that. They totally do it because when your reach is here and then it just goes down to nothing, that's Mm -hmm. very obvious. Like, yeah. Um, it's, it's so frustrating that the accounts who are trying to empower and heal and create positive experiences are the ones that are hurting from, um, these really limited viewpoints, right? I'm like, who do I need to talk to at, at Instagram that I need to connect my friend with, (laughs) I've got my friend, Rachel, I'm going to connect you with, you're all going to do some healing and then create better spaces for us all. Right. Well, it goes back to this idea that like women are allowed to be sexualized, but Mm -hmm. we're not allowed to talk about sex, but we are like, if I was posting like almost nudes on Instagram, I wouldn't be getting shut down or shadow banned. And like the women that do that have huge platforms. And I'm not saying that it's, I'm not shaming them. They should do whatever they want, but it's just to take note of that that is okay, but I'm not allowed to talk about sex because we're only allowed to be sexualized. We're allowed to be commodified. We're not allowed to say, this is my body and this is my pleasure. And as soon as we say that we get shut down. And that is the real issue. The real issue is that we live in a society that's like, you're allowed to be sexualized, but you're not allowed to learn about your body. You're not allowed to learn about sex. You're not allowed to learn about pleasure, but we will sexualize the fuck out of you. Yeah. And, and we're just going to have fun controlling you all. Right. Yeah. Back to here's your permission to post this. Um, you have to do it this way and this way and hope that I just, it's so frustrating. I, I do avoid saying, or like typing out words. Cause I know a lot, like even in our Instagram name, it's S dot E dot E like, like dot X dot cast. Like it's so silly. Um, because we will, we, we, get banned or we won't get put in front of an audience. And it's the whole reason I made this podcast is because I don't have to watch what I say. I can, um, you know, I'm really, I try to be very careful even when I have guests that I don't follow my agenda either. Um, and because that's a form of censoring as well. I know it's on my platform and my podcast name, but it's so important for me to allow others to discover different viewpoints, even if I don't personally agree with it. There's a very specific interview I'm thinking of right now that I was like, interesting. And it was, you know, I had to definitely put my coach face on and was like, no, you know, I, this person is whole. I'm not judging this person. Although my personal beliefs clash with this, you know? And so it was just one of those that it was, yeah, back to social media. That's pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. That's why um, I got on Sunroom. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it's really cool. It's an app made by women for women and non-binary creators. And it is like Patreon mixed with TikTok and there's no censorship. So you can scroll and like consume, but mm-hmm. if you like someone's content and want to see more than like three or four posts, you have to subscribe. So we're also paying women for their emotional labor mm-hmm. instead of just like, doing everything for free and I can talk about sex freely. So I've 
got it on that app. And that's been really awesome to get back into talking about the things I want to talk about and not be like S E G G S and like P dash L E A dash S U R E. Ah, maybe we should just come up with our own code. (laughs) (laughs) It's so bad. And it's like, and it's just so frustrating too, that like the lack of sex education in this country just like bleeds over into everything, even as like consenting, consuming adults, like we Mm -hmm. still can't get access to it. But I have to use that as like my fuel and my fire of like, if this is getting banned, this is ridiculous. No wonder like people have so much shame around their bodies and shame around sex and shame around their kinks and fetishes because there's not accessible education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But guess what? Pornhub is a click away yes. and you know, that has all of the education I need on it. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and it is, it's just so readily at hand, which is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm a consumer on that stuff as well, but having the healthier messages, the other side of that coin, we are completely being silenced and shunned and shamed still in a weird light. It's so weird. It's like everyone talks about sex, um, but no one's willing to like go find a healthier version or like create more opportunity to learn about it. You know, it's just this like fun thing that they're always trying to go find. Um, I'm not very eloquent right now. Like I told you, (laughs) At the end great. of the day, I was like, I oh, know, hopefully my energy isn't too low, but, uh, it's, it's one of those that I, I love hearing. So you said it was sunroom. Is it sunroom.com? Yeah, sunroom. Is it an app? It's an app and, um, it's really cool. So it's like $5 a month to subscribe to me and I post three times a week. And then also it's cool because, um, if you want like a video response to a question or a like voice note response to a question you can do all of that on there too so Mm -hmm. it's like really great to create um just more of a container to hold people instead of just like wide net that you're casting you're like I don't know who's here right yeah that's the other part it's like I have no idea who's who's listening if this is even reaching anyone like you said I mean I had like three months where my story views were less than 100 every day and I was like you say you don't shadow ban, but this is definitely a shadow ban because I have like 8,000 followers. I should have more than a hundred people viewing my story. Mm. Yeah. It's yeah. super weird. I never, and you, I feel so powerless too. Mm-hmm. Like, just like you said, I love that you brought up emotional labor. You put so much work and energy into curating messaging that you can give in, you know, 60 seconds or less, or that you can get in a cute, quick little sound bite or an image. Um, like I have gone the super cheap route on our social media because I loathe all the time (laughs) that it sucks up. And I'm like memes, woohoo, like super easy. Oh, here's an announcement. We have a new episode coming out. Come buy a t-shirt or something like it. I've had to, because I have used so much of my time and then getting shadow banned or, um, you know, getting no views or really inappropriate comments that just make me feel very violated. And it was like, that's not my intention on being social media. I appreciate the attention, but not that kind, please. Like I'll trade you for someone else. Um, so it's, it's frustrating when that is, I feel again, just so powerless. And I think social media has done this weird thing where people expect people to work for free, right? Mm -hmm. We're expected to create an immense amount of content to keep up with the algorithm, to keep up with being seen all for free. It's really time consuming. Like for us that are on there that like want to get messages across, they want to help people that want to reach people, right? With this education. And we're maybe not like content creators or like influencers. It's a total different world. And then people get used to commodifying us and like using and taking and taking and taking and taking and then not inputting or giving back. There's like no energetic exchange. It's just like this succubus, right? And social media has created that 
of like, we're not going to, I'm going to speak specifically to women. We're not going to pay women for emotional labor. Like that's what it is. You have to do all of this to keep up with algorithm and you're not going to get paid for it. Mm-hmm. And you might get a few views. Right. And it's just like really toxic when you think about the toll it has on our mental health and all of these other things. And this lie that like, well, social media is free marketing. It's not free marketing. Your energy yeah. and your mental health are sucked. Yeah. <laughs> I, and it's one of those that I, I have said over and over again, if I didn't have a podcast or coaching business, I would not be on social media. I would never care to be on social media. It's such a difficult, um, place to be. And, and you really hit that definition for me is it just sucks so much energy and gives nothing back or it's very surface level. Um, and then it's that constant need to be better. I need to learn how to edit videos better. I need to, you know, go pay for this other app that does editing or, um, has more of these things that I need that are for my niche. Like, it's just so hard and it's really hard for me being a professional and seeing those who, I'm going to get on a soapbox. Wow. I didn't mean to just go here, but we're going here, right? Seeing uh, as a professional who has dedicated years to my, um, you know, my discipline and then I know where you're going and I have things to add. (laughs) You're like, yes, let's do it. Um, snakes unite, right? I'm just kidding. (laughs) We'll have to fill everyone in on that in a second, but, um, it, it, yes, exactly. I have dedicated years of practice to my discipline of education. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have gone into being a professional that does not cause harm. And then someone who's just better at social media marketing gets all the clients and all the cash and does so much more harm and then uses the name of my discipline as their grab. And it's so difficult for me to be okay with it. And it so I've just been, sick. yeah. And, and I've had folks who've been like, oh, I've seen a coach. And I'm like, okay, tell me about that experience. And then it was, okay. It sounds like you had someone who knew a little bit about a topic and then, um, told you what your, Uh, choices were took away your choice and your autonomy Mm -hmm. and, you know, created some harm and can create a lot of harm or even the whole like toxic positivity side of it too, where they're only like cheerleaders over here. Yeah, you can do it. And then it's like, you never gave anyone that realistic expectation or, or supported them in their human experience. You just said you could totally be perfect. If you do this, this, and this, I don't know. Whew. Okay. Rachel, well, I'll I, give you the mic. I hear it. I'm like, it's so, I, I agree. It's so frustrating. Like there's this woman I follow and I, we've, cause she reached out to me. Cause she also grew up in high control religion, found me and was like, blah, blah, blah. We, we became friends and it, social media friends. And then she went through a big breakup. And the week later, she's like, I'm a dating coach now. And I'm a breakup expert. And I was like, this is so damaging to the field and to people who spend, like you said, thousands of dollars, Mm -hmm. thousands of hours, like niching this field are trauma informed, like have these credentials and these certifications for someone just to be like, I'm a dating coach now because I went through a bad breakup. It's like, that's not how that fucking works. That's Mm -hmm. not how that works, but they have a huge reach and they're getting clients like crazy. And then they're doing so much. It's not And like, it's hard to explain this because it's not that they're like, I'm jealous. It's not a jealousy thing. It's like, you're doing, I know you're doing harm. Mm -hmm. If you do not have training in this, you should not be doing this. But so many people have like influencer professions and then they just decide to be a coach. It's like, that's not how this fucking works. Especially like, oh, so many people that are like the one that pisses me off the most is like, I'm a divine feminine expert and divine masculine expert. I'm like, okay, cool. Tell me the science and research behind that. And they're like, (laughs) I can't. And I'm like, cool. So it's not fucking real. Great. Yeah. And it's, it's close to cult following, right? It's like, you know, like they're, you're pouring Gator or Gatorade. (laughs) Wrong one. (laughs) Kool-Aid and see, that's how much I'm like, "Ah." anyway, it's, it is so frustrating. And so 
I know it can sound sometimes when I introduce myself with my certifications or my background, um, like I'm boosting myself up, but really I'm trying to set myself um, apart from those who could create that. And I never have come on here and claimed to be a sex expert um, or anything. This is a discovery through the lens of a professional who, you know, can research and look at all those things, but, um, it's, it's really scary that that is out there. And again, to try to educate people on finding a quality coach, go find one. If I'm not your person, that is totally fine. I know so many other quality coaches. Um, and I remember having a conversation with somebody and this is the health and wellness and fitness world of like, I'm a bodybuilder, so I can give you my same meal plan and you can do it too. Yeah. Um, but then they didn't want to be certified trainers. So then they just used coach in front of their name or, you know, I'm, I'm a coach. And, and so I, I questioned somebody out of curiosity again, because I was curious, you know, tell me about, you know, your coaching experience and, and what drove you to this. And they were like, oh, well, I really like this area but there's so much restriction if you're certified or if you become a therapist. And I was like, so there's restriction for a reason because you can do a lot of harm and there's board certifications and governing boards for a reason, because that's going to check that someone is giving quality services. Um, and so it just hurt my soul so much to hear that. And I was like, okay, Um, And that person is wildly popular online and has an amazing business and quite frankly, is just a really, really good salesman. Um, And so it just is, it's so hard to see that. Um, It's so hard to see it because it's like, if you're good at sales, then you're going to get a lot of clients, but you're going to do a lot of harm. mm -hmm. Yeah. What quality of services are you out, are doing out there? And it's actually you know, not just taking that from me, you're putting my name and my certifications in the dirt. And like, Correct. now everyone's like, you know what? I had a coach and they were terrible. No, thanks. Yeah. Like, oh. And I've had to tell so many people and turn so many people away because they came to me asking for something that I don't do. Right. right. And it's, it's, I'm, uh, I want to provide, and I want you to find that answer. And if you come to coaching, you'll probably find out that that's not what you were looking for, for your happiness, but that's okay too. And so i just, I try to be very realistic with folks. And it's like, I'm not here to promise the world when others do. Um, and it, but that's operating in integrity and ethics. And that's what we should all be doing as coaches is like, when we have these calls with people, we're like interviewing each other. Like, are you a good fit for me? And am I a good fit for you? Yeah. Both and like, if we're not energetically matching, if also like you're, if someone's like, I have a terrible eating disorder and I want to work on body image, like, is that something somatics can help you with? Sure. But that's not my niche or my specialty. So I can't work with you, but Mm -hmm. I do have some really awesome people that you can work with. Yeah. It's operating in ethics and integrity too in that. Yes. And then having to educate folks on what coaching is, you know, it's not therapy. However, it can work wonderfully in tandem with therapy. Um, it's not a competition with therapy it's, or even, um, like counseling anything, you know, but it is, it's, it is hard to define it when so many people are practicing it, not in the way it's meant to be practiced. And so (sighs) it's a fight. We'll continue to fight social media and coaches. (laughs) It's so true Um, though. I'm glad we talked about that. I feel like I feel a little bit better after hearing someone uh, share the same sentiments of how hard it is. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and it's, I, I want the best for everyone. And if you're finding that you, your calling is to support others and create space of healing and finding answers and finding happiness, that's so wonderful now, what do you do with it? And, you know, be careful where you're stepping, um, you know, just to make sure you are crossing your T's and dotting your eyes and, um, all of that. But 
Absolutely. Yeah, the coaching field, I think we can we can get a little stricter on. I think we need the social media rules for the coaching fields, right? right. Just shut <laughs> that <laughs> down. Um, you use the word coach and I don't see a certification uploaded, but bye, like all of these. <laughs> Just Absolutely. shadow ban them all. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I just kind of went on a bodily journey there too. I don't know. Like I was just like, oh, let's go. Release. <laughs> yeah. Let it go. So I guess we should probably fill in the listeners when I was like snakes unite or oh. something. But yeah. uh, both Rachel and I have snake tattoos. And we were talking about we loved the symbolism of a snake and everything right before we started recording. So it was just my dumb little inside joke. That's now no longer inside. It is an outside joke. Everyone knows it. But it's not dumb. It was a good uh, uh, turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> Full circle. I'll make that connection. Um, so, how long have you been practicing? Um, Full time for a little over a year. And then Exciting. It, it is. It's like a, no one could have prepared me what it was like to own your own business. It's like no one could prepare you for this. It's just a roller coaster of like, I'm where I'm up here. And the next day it's like, am I going to be able to pay my mortgage? And the next day it's like, oh, I'm grim. It's just like this. Oh uh, yeah. It's riding the wave, but it's like learning how to find all the beautiful moments and the lessons in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I've been practicing total, I guess when I was done with my certifications, I feel like timing is so weird because of COVID. I'm like, we're, what, yeah, we lost, we all lost two time. years. Uh huh. So I finished certifications in 2020. In 2020. Yeah. So, so two years. Seven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it is 2022. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. Um, like, I remember going to school in the pandemic, but like what year was it? It all just kind of bleeds together. <laughs> oh, that's so hard. Yeah. It's been uh, a whirlwind with COVID and just finding resources. And again, like social media blew up during that time. And then how do you differentiate a quality resource or just somebody who's like, I'm going through a breakup. I'm now professional. Um, I encourage people to ask a lot of questions. If you're looking through a coach, like what are you ask them? What are their certifications? What do they do for their own mental health? If they don't, if they can't tell you that they have a therapist or a coach, then they're probably should not be work. You probably shouldn't be working with them because to hold space for other people, you have to make sure that you are working with someone. (laughs) yourself. You do, you do. You easily can start holding on to it. And, um, right after I became certified, um, I was working for a domestic violence and sexual assault, um, service provider. Right. So for, for those who have experienced that and was holding so much space for others, so much space for others. Cause I had just like opened myself, but, and, you know, really wanted to create, um, a non-judgmental space that folks could come. Yeah. And I was burning out so quickly and couldn't figure out. I was just like, I am exhausted. I'm ornery, all of these things. And I'm getting really, really edgy about little things at work. Yeah. And, and then realized like, Oh, <laughs> I have not been taking care of me at all. I can take care of others. So great. But if I'm not taking care of myself, I can't take care of more or, um, I'm just doing you a disservice because I'm not fully present and, um, there. So it was a hard lesson. It was a painful lesson, but absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. You have to have your own support team to support others. We have to, like, you have to have your own team of people that are supporting you. Yeah. 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 Um, any of your TikTok videos or even social media blow up that you weren't expecting and you were like this one out of all of them, why this one? I made a TikTok stitch. It was, everyone's going to know this because it's like annoyingly going around, but like, what's the biggest scam that you didn't think was a scam or that no one knows is a scam. Um, (laughs) and I made a stitch with that and no one viewed it for like a week. And then all of a sudden I went on vacation with my boyfriend over the weekend. And I like opened TikTok when we were coming back into town. And I'm like, this has a hundred thousand views and over 500 comments. What happened? (laughs) And it just like blew up. And I was talking about, um, 
the evangelical Christian church and how it's really hard to leave because there's not a governing body uh, over all evangelicalism. Unlike like Mormonism, you go to one Mormon temple, like they're all the same. Yeah, you're they're all connected. Service, you're going to have the same like flow, you know, and then same with Catholicism. You're going to go to a Catholic service mass and you're going to have the flow and like the priest is going to do the rituals and the rites. And it's very similar. The evangelical Christian church is like the wild, wild west. And it's like, everything's different. You have no idea what you're getting. You go to a five hour church service or a 30 minute one. You have no idea. Wow. Some people I do, some won't. Some will do like long worship services. Some won't. And so it's all different. But because of that, I said like, this is the scam is like people stay longer then like with Mormonism, I, cause I work with a lot of former Mormons. It's like, as soon as they realized like the religion was false, yes. they were like, I'm done. I don't need to go to another temple or like talk to anyone. Like I'm done with Christianity. It's like this slow trickle. What out. if I tried this one? Right. Exactly. This might be a different spin yeah. on it. Yes. Let me, go to the church oh, yeah. down the street. Let me go to that church. And then it also like really hurts you because you start to believe that the problem is with you. You're like, I just can't find the right church. I'm not good enough. I'm not close enough to God instead of realizing that the problem is with the religion. So I see so many people stay and myself included stay, my sister too, stay in religion way in evangelical Christianity way too long because you just like, if I could just find the right church, if I could just find the right small group, if I could just find the right one and everywhere you go, it's a little bit of a different flavor. And so you're like, maybe this is the one, maybe this is the right one. And so you, it's like this trap that you can't get out of. Oh, um, it's funny you say that. Cause as my, my spouse and I were leaving the Mormon church, um, he was like, well, let's try this one up the street, you know, some Christian church. And I was like, I am not trading one for the other. I am out, out. Yeah. And I, you know, it was again, that whole shame of, your kids are going to be unhealthy now that you're not part of a church. And I, and he was just like that community. I was really worried about losing that community. And it was, it was really difficult for the first couple of years. You have to rebuild and restructure your entire support system. Every interaction is going to be different with people after they find out you've left. Um, you're going to feel like they're just trying to sell, sell you back in and pull you back in every interaction. And so it's really hard to just trust authentic communication. Um, and so to just be like, Oh my gosh, you just like me to like me, not because you're like, Ooh, I've got a brownie point. Cause I brought someone back to the church. Yeah. Um, so it was just so hard to differentiate those relationships and create that space. But, um, and how long ago did you guys leave? Uh, so my daughter just turned nine and she was an even one. Okay. When we were. Yeah. Little. So I left like 11 years ago. So similarly, okay. there also was no online communities for this. No, so you, you were alone. If like, it was, it was people who were so angry that they were almost creating the same argument, but just on a different side. And I didn't want to be with like that. I, I wasn't angry. I was broken. I was hurt. I was, you know, like alone. You just feel so alone. Um, and it's, it's great now that I've, I've met some amazing coaches (laughs) and connections who, who do support that faith transition or, you know, that leaving and how to rebuild who you are without what you've been told. You can't create a healthy, happy human being without, and yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> so yeah. it's like the last line in my book is like every, something to the effect of like everything that I was taught, I couldn't have and be happy and healthy. I have, and I'm happier and healthier than I've ever been. Ever been right. Yeah. Ever mm-hmm. been. I just sat there in awe one day thinking the same thing. And I was all so much happier. I was miserable. Every moment felt guilty every moment. Um, and really was far more worried what others thought of me than what I thought of me. And I'm like, Psh, don't care about that. Like take it or leave it. That's fine. If I'm not your cup of tea, I am my cup of tea. I enjoy me. Um, so it's so cool that you've been able to hold that space for a lot of other people, especially that shame and around sexuality and, and your body. That's, yeah. That was just 
it's so interesting because growing up being told like your body is a tool to, Mm. um, give yourself this earthly experience, but then don't use it as a tool, (laughs) only use it for this specific purpose. You are not an all purpose tool. You are a one size (laughs) only fits this. That's it for your husband's pleasure. And Mm -hmm. when he wants, that's it. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's, when I think back, it's like, it's crazy how much I accepted that too for so long and didn't Not question it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They normalize it so much and that everyone seems to be speaking it. No one seems to be feeling it mm-hmm. right? until you start to unravel. And then you're like, wow, I thought I was happy and I was miserable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you said, it's like, I thought I was living the greatest life and I'm out and unraveling it. And it's like, I was absolutely miserable. I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing. And I, I was only doing things for others. Correct. And others expectations. And then that is a huge journey along itself is like how to recognize what I want and then to follow that. Um, I mean, that's still a huge piece for my own healing and my own therapy journey yeah. is like recognizing my own needs and then being able to communicate them because for so long I was able to read others so well and give them what they wanted because that was survival, right? That is what gets you the kudos in that and communities. Um, so yeah. that's the ultimate plight of women in high control religions is be people pleaser, be a people mm-hmm. pleaser, like martyr yourself at all costs, at all costs, not just for your partner in a sexual way, but for your children in a motherly way for your neighbor, for everyone else, but yourself, um, your needs do not exist. And and if you kind of maybe think they do, they are at the bottom of the totem pole. You have to serve everybody else first. Correct. Yeah. And it's just, it's so harmful, but it's, but it's what keeps women staying, right? It's Mm because we're, you, it's you, what keeps those religions going around because yeah, going. <laughs> without that free labor. <laughs> yeah. The religion survives on the emotional free labor of women. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It survives on them encouraging women not to have jobs and like donate all their time to the church and childcare mm-hmm. and to help all these people. It survives on women like you know, making meals and doing this and that whenever there's a tragedy or, or a celebration, it survives on so much emotional labor of women. Like if women in religion were just like, I'm not doing this anymore. Religion would halt. There would be, there'd be, there'd be nothing to do. And because honestly, like religion is the ultimate example of like white men failing up. Like they can't do it on their own. No. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And we have been told that that is what our higher calling is, is to support these men making all these decisions and controlling me so much so they can have the control, right? That they can keep the control. Um, And as soon as they find out, (laughs) yeah, like, this is the scam, ladies, this is the scam. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Uh, it's been so much fun, Rachel, just talking about all these things going on this, just a journey and conversation alone. And I want to just say, I am so proud of you for recognizing that and having your own journey and turning that around and connecting that with others and providing that service for others who really need it. Um, we need more of you. And so keep being yourself, keep, uh, fighting that good fight and fuck you social media. And we'll we'll fix things one day at a time. Um, But thank you. Where can all of our listeners find you, your book, your services, all the fun goodies? So it's all at Rachel Overval on uh, TikTok, on Instagram. And then my website's racheloverval.com. And you can buy my book there. It's also on Amazon. Um, So whatever works for people. And then join Sunroom if you want some actual, like more in-depth sex talk and sex advice. Um, uncensored. Yeah. That's not true. Censored. Authentic uncensored. <laughs> exactly. And so that's where you can find me. Love it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And for all of our listeners, if you want to find out more about the podcast or support the podcast financially, you can go to saltysexcast.com. We have our links to our Patreon, our, all of our listening platforms, 
Um, YouTube's fun. You can, you know, follow us on YouTube, subscribe, like, share. We're a video podcast. It's kind of fun to see people and just, you know, see their facial expressions, their personality as well. Um, so catch us on there, but thank you all for listening and I will see you all next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Salty Sex Cast. Ready for round two? Find us on Facebook.